catch my breath. My chest consists my chest consists. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My chest consists my chest consists. All right, let's begin, shall we? Bismillah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina. Wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah. Wa man yudlil falahadiyah lah. اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد ladies and gentlemen my brothers and my sisters we begin as per usual we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for each and every blessing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us and hopefully by being thankful to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase his favors upon us insha'allah we also begin this gathering by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send prayers and blessings and salutations to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the family of the Prophet, the companions of the Prophet, the tabi'een, the atba'i tabi'een, and to whomsoever that follows in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam till the end of time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah bless this gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increases us in knowledge. And hopefully with the increase in knowledge, the increase in humility and humbleness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah provides cure to those amongst us who are unwell and our family members. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides ease and facilitation to those who are facing hardships and tribulations in life. And finally, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah forgives us all inshaAllah. Our family members, especially our parents, our loved ones and the rest of the Muslimin and Muslimat. Ameen ya Rabbal Alameen. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and how is everybody doing? Sihat semua? Alhamdulillah, welcome everybody, really happy to see you all. Um, Alhamdulillah, we are gathered again for our CWG program. So for those who are new here, this is a tafsir program in which we discuss certain themes that are important and relatable to our lives. And we are currently discussing the theme of Ulul Azmi, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given great amount of determination and will. And these are matters that I think greatly are required in our lives and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for us to be able to follow in their footsteps. Ameen ya Rabbal Alameen. Uh, before I begin, let me just get something uh, out of the way first. For the gentlemen who have been uh, messaging me a lot on WhatsApp and also the pertaining to my cap. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I've been receiving multiple uh, messages. Uh, it's a Oman cap. Oman. And, and I don't think that you can get it in Singapore. And that's as much information that I can provide you. So sorry to disappoint. Uh, that's a weird intro to the class. So ladies and gentlemen, today we are still discussing uh, the story of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we are going to discuss uh, the very end of the life of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam. So I remember beginning the entire discussion by talking about the life of Nabila Ibrahim pertaining to the struggles that he went through and more importantly at times you do find in the Quran uh, an interesting perspective to stories and this is something that we discuss or mention during our conference and again thank you so so much for those who have supported us for that particular event I said on that particular event that when you read history or when you read stories the difference between the Quran and every other story that you would read would be every other history or story are captured and observed by men. And men are limited by their perceptive faculties, their senses. The Quran, however, when you read the stories of the Quran, Allah would tell you whatever that is apparent, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would also tell you what is not apparent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us pertaining to what men see, 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us pertaining to what happens deep inside the hearts. So that's a unique kind of a perspective that the Quran has pertaining to stories. In the story of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam, a lot goes out outside. Many things happen. The struggles of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam. But what is interesting from the perspective of the Quran is Allah captures the emotions and the feelings of Nabiullah Ibrahim for us. Today, inshallah, we're going to go to the very last portion of the life of Nabila Ibrahim, which is none other than uh, the part in which Allah tests Ibrahim with the test of sacrifice, particularly sacrificing his own son. Right? And this is arguably the last event in the life of Nabila Ibrahim, or at least one of the last things that happened in his life. And for those who would want to uh, look at the reference for this, and this is in Surah Al Safat. So this is in Surah Safat. So Allah says in the Quran, I'm going to read part of it. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Rabbi habli minas salihin. Fabasharnahu bi ghulamin halim. Falamma balaga ma'ahu sa'i. Qala ya bunay, inni ara fil manami anni azbahuk. Fa'unzur ma tara. Qala ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Satajiduni insha'allahu minas sabirin. And the translation goes, Oh my Lord, grant me a righteous son. So we gave him the good news of a forbearing wise boy. Then when the son reached the age of serious work with him, he said, Oh my son, I see in my vision that I offer you in sacrifice. Now see what is my so what is my view, your view, sorry. And the son said, Oh my father, do as you are commanded, and you will find me if Allah so wills a person who is practicing patience and constancy. Now Again, this is rather a summary of some events during the time of Nabiullah Ibrahim and it peaks at the moment of the sacrifice. And Allah begins talking about this particular issue by mentioning the dua of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam as he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child. And at this point, we can notice that the dua of Nabiullah Ibrahim is precise and, and, and concise and he's asking for the right things and we've talked about this before right that Nabila Ibrahim is a person who has done everything correctly we mentioned many times already and particularly from last week that Allah tells us that a person who looks away a person who ignores the ways of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam is none other than a fool Ibrahim illa man safiha nafsa and whoever that is not interested in the ways of Nabila Ibrahim does not follow in his footsteps is but a fool. So in everything that Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam does, it is beneficial. So he's asking for a son, he's asking for a child, and he is asking for a particular thing. So in this particular dua of Nabila Ibrahim, we can say that Nabi Ibrahim mentions three things. He's asking for a child, he's asking for three things. Number one would be, he uses the word Rabbi Habli And then he says, Min as salihin And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fabasharnahu bi min halim So these are the three characteristics of the child According to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam hopes for And when you look at couples who are married are uh, Thinking of having a child There might be different aspirations and goals and objectives some which might be praiseworthy and some that may not necessarily be fitting. And here we are looking at Nabila Ibrahim. He intends a child. He is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child and three things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. And the first one is none other than the word habli. Rabbi habli. And I think that we've discussed this particular matter before and, and the word habli is a verb in which its noun is hiba. And I've said many times pertaining to this particular issue, and as you all know, the name of my daughter is Hiba. And, and it's, a, it's a story in which we truly feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted us with a child. To understand that this is something that Allah provides, it's a providence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that which allows for a sense of joy and happiness. And that is also when it is considered to be a, a noble act, when you see a person having a newborn or when you hear of a person having a newborn that you make dua for them and this is something unique about our practices that there is nothing that we experience in life whether it is a religious matter or it is a spiritual matter except for there is some form of a response towards it with a dua in every situation right 
you look at something as small as the Hisnul Muslim and this is me recommending everybody to accompany yourself with always a book of dua or zikr and people would always ask me like what books of zikr or dua would you recommend the most concise and precise one would be the Hisnul Muslim the fortification of a Muslim what is it called in English? is it the fortification of a Muslim? a fortress of Muslim the fortress of Muslim thank you so much right available in, in PDF versions as well as physical versions as well it's a very concise one and even for that small booklet it in all honesty would suffice your daily needs if anybody would like to be a bit more adventurous and, and explore a bit more uh, you are welcome to look at the book of Al Imam Nawawi Rahmatullah Ali titled The Azkar Al Azkar of Al Imam Nawawi Rahmatullah Ali also translated into many different languages as well uh, and, and here you are talking about hearing a person having a, a newborn and there is a dua that is recommended and the dua is Barakallahu laka fil mawhubi lak wa shakarta wahib but I need to also uh, mention something important first that this is actually not directly a dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but rather the dua of the later generation and particularly it is attributed to Al-Hassan al-Basri the great scholar of Basra Al-Hassan a uh, great amount of contributions academically and spiritually coming from his behalf uh, this is also to indicate that you know what we also find certain guidance uh, through the early generations whatever their practices for example uh, a good example of this particular matter also would be that in many of our gatherings when you end a gathering, what is it that you would recite usually? Tasbih kafara, and then at times in certain gatherings as well, you would recite wal asr, correct? For our class, my ending would always be, are you ready for nasi kanda? Now as for tasbih al kafara, it is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam accurately. But the recitation of surat wal asr was not the practice of the Prophet. It was the practice of the companions of the Prophet, ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'in. And uh, the narration suggests that we amongst the companions of the Prophet would not gather, commune, and then part except for that we remind each other pertaining to the importance of time. And for that we recite Wal Asr. So it is a recommended practice, but one should not attribute that particular practice to the Prophet ﷺ directly. So this dua is similar. So you will say, Barakallahu laka fil mawhubi lak wa shakarta al-wahib. When you hear a person with a newborn, you say, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted you with. So again, it's an acknowledgement that this is none other than a gift from Allah. Wa shakarta al-wahib. And thanks is to the one who has gifted you. So whenever that a child is mentioned in our religion, the connotation is always that it is none other than a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child, he is specific in regards to his want and he says, Rabbi habli. Ya Allah, gift me. Ya Allah, present to me as a child a gift. Now and then he says, Rabbi habli minas salihin. Allow for that the child and of many different characteristics and traits of a good person I hope that this child is amongst the Salih And the word Salih I think is a very generic term that we use Whenever that we see a person that might be uh, a knowledgeable person or a person of Ibadah We say this is a person who is Salih But the term Salah in the Arabic language has a very specific connotation The word Salah in the Arabic language and its opposite is Fasad which means corruption a salih is a person who betters his condition and betters the condition of his environment. That's a salih. Wherever that he is visited, he only brings about good. That's a salih. And that is what we should aspire to become. That our presence affect things and people well. So that's the child that you would want. A child who betters himself always and is a source of good and betterment for others. So that's the second mention of Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now as for the third thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions is that Allah says فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ And so we gave him the glad tidings of a forbearing child, a child of forbearance. The word hilm could mean two things, either a person of virtue and wisdom and if not a person of forbearance. And there is a correlation between both. It is only when a person has insight and knowledge and understanding that he can become a forgiving or forbearing person. And I think that we've discussed this particular, con this particular character before. The word hilm, the word forbearance means a person who has the ability to forgive when he has the choice to punish. Somebody wronged you and you can call him up, but you choose not to. 
you choose to make dua for that particular person may Allah forgive you and you know what this might be a mistake in order for a person to do that it is not a automatic response but rather it comes with knowledge that you know what I want that if I am to wrong a person that that person would forgive me I would want that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls himself by the exalted names of Ghaffar and Ghafur and Ghafir I would also want to embody that kind of character as well only if you understand that then you can actually be empathetic or forbearing towards people so these are the three characteristics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the child here later on we know him to be Nabila Ismail now what is also interesting about this particular three characteristics is in fact that Allah actually even before this actually characterize or define Ibrahim first alayhi salatu wasalam with these three characteristics so Ibrahim himself was a gift from Allah Ibrahim himself is a Salih and Ibrahim himself was a person of Hilm he has those qualities first and then he's asking these things for his own child our scholars comment on this particular issue to suggest that if you know that something is valuable you would want it for other people as well and if you want other people to have those important qualities you need to yourself struggle and strive towards those characteristics as well i remember a particular discussion that i once had with my wife and this is years ago and i was giving my blunt observation commentary pertaining to certain things that i saw at the mosque and you guys know me i'm a very frank person and my frankness and bluntness has put me in trouble many times but I think that I'm one who do not shy from controversy and I, I, I just bottle things up, I do. So I was observing a particular thing. I used to send my daughter to madrasa, to kindergarten at Masjid Al-Ghufran. And I would see a number of couples in which, uh, I'm not sure what you would make of this, who start to rope su'zon ke orang. Tapi tak apalah, I just tell my story. I would see certain parents in which they would they would send their children to kindergarten at a mosque and they would not be dressing appropriately they would not be carrying themselves appropriately and I told my wife like mm, I, I don't like what I see and my wife would be asking me like what, what are you not comfortable with I'm like they want religious knowledge for their children they want good values to be imbibed and to be applied by their children but they themselves have not put in the effort to try and fulfill the commandments of god and my wife would tell me that maybe they are still in the process of trying to change they are learning i'm like okay you choose that path of husnuzan and let me be the evil person here <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And in all honesty, deep in my heart, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever that is in the process of change, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate your matter. But I think that methodologically, methodologically, it's a bit off. If you think that going to a religious class is important, if you think that changing into a better person is important, you do it first. And this is a particular method that we see consistent in the Quran, right? In the hadith of the Prophet as well. What did the Prophet say? Ibda bi nafsika wa min baitik. You begin with yourself and then your family that's the methodology you're not supposed to have a sense of capableness towards people and concern about people but you don't care about the betterment of your own self what did the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say min husni islam il mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni from a sign of the excellence of a believer is that he does not care so much about whatever that is happening outside but rather he busies himself with whatever that concerns him first and then others so before Nabila ibrahim alayhi sallam asked allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let this child be a gift let this child be a salih let this child be a person of forbearance before he asks for that he has already attained it first he has worked towards it first and then he says yeah Allah I know that these are valuable things so I also would want it for my children as well right as the Arabs would say a person who does not have cannot give right al la as the Arabs would say a person who does not have cannot give so as a parent you must make sure that first now and then it moves on to say فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي قَالَ يَا بُنَيْ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ and then Allah subhanahu wa fast forward to the very end of the life of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam and we've talked about this particular issue before right 
when you look at the stories of the Quran, they are not chronological. And because that's not the intent of the Quran, chronology may not necessarily be the main concern. There are certain stories in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell you chronologically, meaning according to the time. From the beginning, the middle, the end. In certain stories, Allah subhanahu does not use that particular approach. Allah subhanahu is just focusing on what matters for this discussion. The discussion here is in fact talking about the sacrifice of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's it. The beginning is required to make a correlation between Nabiullah Ibrahim and his son. What he felt about his son. He's been asking Allah subhanahu for a child all this while. Allah gave him a particular child and now he needs to sacrifice the child. That's the point of this order. Now here it says, then when the son reached the age of Asai, meaning the, the boy has now grown up. And in the historical work, there are certain discussions. At what age did the sacrifice happen? Or the test of sacrifice happened. Al Imam Al Razi Rahmatullahi in his tafsir he mentions two. He says that some scholars say at the age of 13, and some scholars say at the age of 15. And that's a difficult time. I'm not sure whether I should even say this as an ustaz, but you know what? If the child is a very young boy, an infant, it might be easier for you to kind of put him down. Makes me a horrible person to say that. At the age of 13 and 15, now the boy has attained a bit of strength. And the boy may wrestle his way out and so on and so forth, right? But again here, Allah subhanahu wa says, when Ismail reached an age of youth, but there's an interesting detail that Allah mentions here. Allah says, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي When Ismail reached that particular stage of life, together with his father, to mean what? Allah is hinting to us that the development of a young boy is going to be greatly successful when the father has accompanied the child all this while. Whenever that we talk about the notion of nurturing a child, usually we think about the relationship between the mother and the child. The mother is the first madrasa, as the Arabs would say. That's where the child begins his education pertaining to the world and the reality around him. But there are many parts of the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also emphasizes not only the relationship between child and mother, but rather the child and the father. And today that seems to be a bit of a complication. The father goes out to work and leaves everything pertaining to the upbringing of the child to the mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that part of the upbringing of Nabila Ismail alayhi salam, while I may even dare say that a huge part of the upbringing of Nabila Ismail was contributed by whom? Ibrahim, the father. So a father should not neglect the issue of taking care of the child and ensuring that the cultivation of values and character comes from him. Particularly for a boy because he needs a reference for manliness and masculinity. Now and then he says, Ya bunayya inni ara fil manami anni adhbahuk. Oh my son, oh my child. And the word bunay in the Arabic language is an interesting term as well. Usually in the Arabic language when you would want to say a son or a child, what word do we use usually? Help me out. Bismillah. A boy or a child. I say the word walad. Walad. Or you would also say the word ibn. Or you would also say the word bani. The word bunai is an endearing term. Right? Ya bunai. Similar to what you would find in Surah Luqman. Ya bunayya la tushrik billah inna shirka la zulmun azim So he is speaking to his son endearingly and softly but the content does not fit the tone he is being soft and endearing but the content is this oh my son I saw in my dream that I am supposed to sacrifice you I'm supposed to sacrifice you and then he says fanzur ma tara So tell me what you think about it and this is, I think, one of the weirdest conversations that a father can ever have with his son. I cannot imagine on a Sunday morning, my father would wake me up, Taufik, I saw in my dream that I'm going to have to sacrifice you. What do you think about it? There's no negotiation there. I'm running away far. 
But Ibrahim trusted his son so much and this is also interesting, right? We are talking about the greatness of Ibrahim and how he is a great man, but now we are shifting the attention to his son, that his son was also a great man. The son was trusting enough towards the father that the father afforded to even ask him, what do you think? So it's a mutual relationship in that particular sense pertaining to trust and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does the son reply with? Qala ya abati. Same thing. How do you say my father in Arabic? Abi. This is not Abi. This is what? Abati. Same thing. An endearing term in the Arabic language. So he is also maintaining respect and composure and compassion towards the father. Ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Do whatever that you have been commanded, for you shall find me, God willing, amongst those who are patient. Now this is the story, right? Now and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Falamma aslama wa tallahu lil jabin. Allah says, and they both submitted their will to Allah, and he had laid him prostrate on his forehead for sacrifice. Now a number of important things here again, right? Now, look at point number three. Here, who is slaughtered? Was it Ismail or Ishaq? This is one question that our scholars ask. Now, I said earlier on that I am of the opinion that the one who is slaughtered is none other than Nabiullah Ismail. Now, I'm just telling you that if you read the works of Tafsir, do not be surprised to find an alternative opinion to this particular matter. There are some scholars who in fact suggest that it was Ishaq and not Ismail. <coughs> And if you look at it from the biblical perspective and also from the Judaic perspective, it is not Ismail but rather Isaac, Ishaq. So the dominant position in Islam is that it is Ismail for a number of reasons. So this is how we go about Islamic discourse, right? You would mention opinions, but then you need to also understand why are the opinions as so. then there is no meaning in knowing these opinions. Now there are a number of reasons why it is considered to be the case that it is stronger than we suggest that it is Ismail than it is Ishaq. Number one will be that it is a particular hadith of the Prophet wasallam, in which once the Prophet said, Ana ibn I am the son of two sacrifices. As for the first sacrifice, he is referring to the sacrifice made by his grandfather Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib once did a particular project pertaining to the preservation or the extension of the well of Zamzam. And it was a difficult task. And the grandfather of the Prophet made a nazar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, if this is successful, I would slaughter in your name. So it is in reference to that. And it was a well-known story amongst the Arabs. As for the second, and he was asked, and what is the second sacrifice? He said, the sacrifice of Ismail. And the Prophet mentioned Ismail and not Ishaq. So that's first, the first evidence. In all honesty, if I stopped here, that would have sufficed. But just for the sake of academic discourse, we'll continue. Number two would be that from a historical perspective, Ishaq never reached Makkah. And the context of the slaughter and before that the erection of the pillars of Kaaba, all of it happened where? Makkah. Historically, Ishaq never reached Makkah. So it couldn't have been Ishaq. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions to us this. Satajinuni insha'Allah tu minas sabirin. Amongst the characteristics of Nabiullah Ismail that has been repeated consistently and repeatedly in the Quran, that he is amongst the patient. And Allah has never used that particular term, at least in the Quran, to refer that particular characteristic to Ishaq. Ishaq has many other characteristics, but Allah does not mention pertaining to him being patient. So the word Sabir here should also refer to whom? Ismail. So again, there are two opinions pertaining to who was slaughtered. Do not be surprised if you find a person say it was Ishaq, because there are some opinions. And it's also narrated to the, it's also attributed to the narration of scholars like Ibn Abbas and also Umar ibn Khattab. In all honesty, but the stronger opinion is is Ismail. Allah Taala Allah Wa Alam. Now again, one zero three. Falamma aslama wa tallahu lil jabin. Allah says, when Ibrahim went to the sun and said, "I saw in my dream that I'm supposed to sacrifice you. What do you see? What do you think?" And the sun replied by saying, "Oh Father, oh my dear Father, do whatever that you are commanded. You shall find me amongst the patient, insha Allah. And now they prepare for that particular ritual." 
وَتَلَّهُ فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ They were put in place and according to the tafsir scholars Ismail then went into the position of prostration to be slaughtered. But before that, the, the, the posture is also interesting. When you slaughter an animal, you don't slaughter an animal that way. It's the opposite, right? But it is in that particular way. To exaggerate or to emphasize the meaning of willingful submission to Allah. But what is also important would be, Allah says, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا Both of them submitted. Who is going to be sacrificed again? Ismail, what Allah said, both of them were submitting to Allah. This is to suggest whenever that you sacrifice in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're going to be talking about the types of sacrifice later on, it is not only an issue, it's not one thing, but at times there are multiple pains that you go through. It could be on your part, it could be on the part of the opposite party, it could be felt now, it could be felt later. But Allah is telling us that pertaining to Nabiullah Ibrahim as a father and Nabiullah Ismail as a son, both of them willingly submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then they enter into that particular state of prostration waiting for the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if you could ever imagine that, having your child prepare to be slaughtered by you, now when that happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quickly then said, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَنْ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا إِنَّا كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ There has already fulfilled the vision, thus indeed do we reward those who do right. For this obviously was a trial. As Ibrahim Alayhisam was about to slaughter and sacrifice his own child, Allah then proclaimed, Allah then made an announcement, Ya Ibrahim, the job is done. Then, whatever that you saw in your vision of the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have already fulfilled it. Then, and we reward those who do good in this particular way. Now, if you think about it, is the deed, is the act completed? No. And last week I remember talking about this idea of invalidating your worship, correct? When you begin worship, you should not invalidate it. You should go through it until the very end. Now here the ritual is slaughter, but nothing has been done yet. The blade has not been even put on the throat. But Allah says, done. The job is completed. And this is how we truly reward those who do good. Now the question here is this, when is the doer of good rewarded? If you think about it, Ibrahim has not done anything except for one thing that Allah mentions at least. The only thing that Nabila Ibrahim and Ismail did is this, submitted to Allah spiritually. That's it. But according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is what Allah actually wants from you submission and your submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough even if you don't follow through our scholars then ask the question when is the doer of good rewarded when is the doer of good rewarded when you do a particular deed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises many things Allah subhanahu says if you pray this particular salat you would get this and that if you do this particular form of charity, you get this and that. And our assumption usually is that it's only until the completion of that particular act that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward you. But according to our scholars, based on this particular story, in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could reward you at the beginning of your deed, not even the end of that particular deed. As soon as you have your intention to do that particular deed and you put in a bit of effort and I was called to say muqaddimatul amal the beginnings of that particular worship the beginnings of it according to this particular verse Allah would have already rewarded you and if this is not the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'm not sure what is Allah does not wait for you until you finish right? that's me with my daughter I will tell my daughter to clean up her room and I'm sure that she is watching this. Heba, if your room is messy, please clean up your room. Masih lagi nak. Tak puas hati. We will tell her, if you clean up your room, we will reward you, but only at the very end. And you will do a bit of a spot check. But Heba, this one is not tidy yet. 
only until she completes the deed i will tell you okay now you get screen time now you get your phone now i'll buy you this or whatever this right allah's not like that when she agrees to the deed my daughter when she begins to put in a bit of work i should have already rewarded her and that's how allah subhanahu wa treats us this is also where our scholars discuss the power of intention our scholars say at times the intention is much more powerful and profound than the act itself and this is understood legally as well right when a person intends to do a particular deed and then there is some form of a obstruction along the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still reward you there was a group of companions of the prophet when the prophet sallallahu alaihi went to war they did not participate and returning from war the prophet turned to the companions of the prophet and he said there are men in medina right now that they did not participate as in battle but they will get the exact rewards as you and the companions felt a bit like Ishtachi. we lay our life we risk everything and you know what if we are rewarded then we are deserving of it but there are men in medina they did not participate with us but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them as well the Prophet said they intended to go to battle, but they were prevented to do so. So your intentions, ladies and gentlemen, are at times greatly much more powerful than the deed itself. And this is not me encouraging you to have empty intentions. Today you start, inshallah, I'm going to do this and that, and not really planning on doing it. But this is talking about intentionally putting in not intention, wanting or to aspire to do a particular matter. And even if you are obstructed from doing so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward you still. But from the perspective of when a person is rewarded, according to this particular story, at the beginnings of the deed. Now, our scholars also say, but from a legal perspective, a legal perspective, you need to complete it entirely. So let's say you're going to pray Zohar later on, right? We start, say I'm going to be rewarded at the beginnings of my prayer. Allahu Akbar. Okay, settle lah, jalan. <laughs> No, from a legal perspective, the obligation is only going to be settled when you complete the deed. I'm talking about the reward. The reward will be given to you at the beginning of your deed. But there is also a possibility, as we all know, that Allah would cancel out the reward. Is that not a possibility? Yep. What did Allah say in the Quran? Ya ayuhalazina amanu, la tubatilu sadaqatikum bil mani wal adha. Kallazi yunfiqu ma lahu riya annas. Wala yu'minu billahi wala bil yawmil akhir. O oh, believers, do not cancel out your own deeds and rewards. In the example of says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person who commits a particular deed and then he is arrogant and he shows off to people. Allah rewards you, but because of your arrogance, Allah takes it back. Is that a possibility? Yes. So again, to be clear, in regards to the timing of reward, there is a possibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward you at the beginning of that particular deed. From a legal perspective, you need to finish it. But is there a possibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might take away your reward? Yes. So still be really careful. Allah ta'ala a'la wa a'la. Now at the end of it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadha lahu wal bala'ul mubin. For this was obviously, obviously a trial. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْهِنْ عَظِيمٌ And we ransomed him with a momentous sacrifice and we left this blessing for him among generations to come in later times. Peace and salutation to Ibrahim. Salamun ala Ibrahim. I remember last week saying that there are multiple situations in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applauds Ibrahim. Ibrahim was such a great prophet that multiple times Allah would stop at a particular place in telling the story and Allah would say, he's done well. He deserves this. He deserves that. And this is part of it. And lastly, Allah says, كَذَلِكَ نَجَزِي muhsinin." Thus indeed do we reward those who do right. Now if you look here, I made it bold. Allah repeats the two statements in this one story. Inna kazalika najzil muhsinin, kazalika najzil muhsinin, and we shall surely at that reward those who do good. Al Imam Al Razi rahmatullah Ali he concludes for us by saying, Allah is reminding us here that whenever that you sacrifice, whenever that you leave out something that you are pleased with, do not ever think that your sacrifices go unnoticed. But rather, Allah surely knows and surely Allah would reward. 
surely. And I'm sure that there are many people who go through life in which they, they strive towards doing one thing and one thing only. Give. Contribute. When nobody else wants to contribute, maybe to family, maybe to people and so on and so forth, they contribute. You hear these kind of things as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. In a particular family, maybe there's an elderly who is unwell. Adik-beradik ramai. But the one who contributes is one person. And they sacrifice a lot to take care of their parents when nobody else cares. And they do not look for a standing ovation or people to clap. They believe that, you know what, it's okay. For Allah is the one who rewards me. I remember years ago, there was a particular person that I, I know of. He's still, I think, a student of al Qudo Academy online as well. And, and he goes up to me. And suddenly, out of nowhere, he says, Ustaz, saya bukan tanak kawin tau, Ustaz. I'm like, oh, that's a really weird preface. <laughs> I didn't ask anything. Uh, I, I think that you guys are aware of my principle. There are two things that you should never ask a person, right? Never see a single person and ask them, when are you getting married? And never go to a married person and ask them, when are you going to have a child? That's not your business. I don't ask these questions. But he went up to me and he suddenly, I'm not sure out of, for whatever reason, he said, saya bukan tanak kawin tau, Ustaz. And then suddenly his tone changed. He said, I, I have parents, old, critically ill. Well, I've actually been engaged before. But it had to be put off because I have to focus on my parents. And nobody knows about this except for you, Ustaz. And I'm like, I'm a bit burdened by this information. Honored as well. But there are people who are like that. They sacrifice so much, but nobody has a clue of whatever that they're doing. Allah says, كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي muhsinin." Allah will surely reward people who do good. Do not ever think, do not ever dare to think that your sacrifice goes unnoticed. Now this is the particular part in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this issue of sacrifice. Now, there is also an important thing that some of our scholars mention as well. Pertaining to sacrifice, <coughs> pertaining to deeds as well, pertaining to tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are two types of tests. There is a reactive test and then there's also a proactive test. And what I mean by that would be reactive tests are tests by which you do not put in the first step. But rather it comes to you. Nobody wants to be ill. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people with illness and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afford us all al -afiyah. Nobody wants to be unwell. But it comes to you. So this is what I mean by a reactive. So you will need to then react to that particular test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accordingly. And then there are tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which you actually took it up proactively. And this is usually what you call by sacrifice. You put in the work and nobody asks you to do so. But you do it simply because you want betterment for people. You want comfort for people. You want pleasure for people. And hence the definition of, of sacrifice is putting aside your pleasure to please people. That's sacrifice. Putting aside your comfort for the comfort of others. Putting aside the reward of your own self for the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, when He talks about this notion of sacrifice over and over again in the Quran, it is none other than described with a sense of honor and a sense of humility. Now, that was, ladies and gentlemen, one of the last events that happened during the time of Nabila Ibrahim. At the very end of the life of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the story of Ibrahim. This is how Allah ends the story. So this is before the happy ending. So this is before the end. Allah says, وَإِذِ ibrahim إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ قَالَ إِنِّي جَعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامَ قَالَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِ الظَّالِمِينَ now, here Allah says, and when his Lord tried Ibrahim with many tasks, he fulfilled, fulfilled them all. He said, surely I will make you an imam of men. And Ibrahim said, what about my offspring? Allah replied by saying, my covenant does not include the unjust. Now, the beginning of this particular verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact praises Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam greatly. 
wa izi batala ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimatin fa atammahun we have tested ibrahim with many things throughout the entirety of his life and he completed them all now this is important to note because it is evident and proven that some prophets alayhi wassalatu wassalam they came a bit short remember the story of nabila yunus there is a portion of that particular story that that yunus alayhi wassalam came a bit short he left his people in anger remember and then he left on the ship and then he was found in the belly of the whale he felt a bit he fell a bit short and it happens to a number of other prophets as well and this is just to indicate their humanness now for nabila ibrahim all of the tests of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ibrahim fulfilled them with excellence completed them all now when allah told ibrahim that allah also told nabila ibrahim because this is who you are this is your reputation this is your cv allah says inni ja'ilu kalin nasi imama we shall surely give you authority we shall give you leadership for the entirety of mankind and this is a particular verse and again this is part of surah al-baqarah and a huge part of surah al-baqarah addresses bani israel and some scholars say that this is a particular verse that the bani israel are not pleased with because for them they claim to nabi ibrahim alaihi salam ours allah says no Ibrahim is a prophet for everyone. Everyone. Inni ja'ilu kalin nasi imama. And it's also a unique attribute because the majority of prophets were not sent to the entirety of men. Usually the case would be that every prophet is only sent to their, their people. There are only two prophets in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we send you to the entirety of men. Nabila Ibrahim and our prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Correct? Now, at this, at this, Ibrahim alayhi salam replied by saying, Qala wa min zurriyati. Me, what about my lineage? What about my family? Now, our scholars point out something interesting. When you have reached to a sense of accomplishment, right and allah subhanahu mentions your reward usually you are entitled to a dua so that is why dua that are considered to be greatly effective dua that has higher level of istijaba usually happens at the end of worship pertaining to day and night right let's look at night when is the best timing for dua the end of the night in salat one of the places in which you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is before salam dua that is mustajab is usually at the end of something when you've accomplished something you make a dua now at this particular point Allah says you've done everything well you are a leader now Ibrahim is supposed to make a huge dua ya Allah because I've done my job I demand this and this and this for myself Ibrahim alayhi salam was not concerned about the reward he was concerned about responsibility and that is what makes him an important leader of Islam I don't care about the reward so much I don't care about this award this praise that you give me so much I'm here to put in the work a bit more Ya Allah what about my lineage not only my children not only Ismail and Ishaq but rather the entirety of my, my progeny now this is where it gets a bit uncomfortable for Ibrahim what does Allah say for a person who has done everything Allah says I'm sorry but you know what my covenant does not cover those who are unjust what does it mean that in your lineage later on there shall be people who are good and there shall be people who are bad my blessing my river does not cover everybody that's a possibility and we know for a fact pertaining to Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam we have Ismail and Ishaq from Nabila Ishaq alayhi salam we have Banu Israel and this is also what the Banu Israel are rather angry about because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in the Quran some of the lineage of Nabila Ibrahim Allah will not be pleased with for us it is clear who those people are so this verse angers a lot of some other communities in that particular sense but again coming from the perspective of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam it was rather a sad thing 
Now in analysis, what is jahan al bayta masabat al linnas? Now we will not give you that. We will not give you that your entire lineage would be good people. We will not give you that. But let me give you something else. So this is the alternative. So this is how you safeguard. This is the effort that you put in to ensure that as much of your community will become good people. Allah says, "Wa is jaan al bayta masabat al linnasi wa amna, wa taqidu min maqami Ibrahima musalla." And when we made the house a sanctuary for men and security. And appoint for yourselves a place of prayer on the standing place of Ibrahim. Now, a number of important things here. Number one is that Allah says, "Wa is jaan al bayta masabat al linnas." So we have made that building that Ibrahim erected, i.e., the Kaaba, masabat al linnas. The word masaba here is translated as what is translated as sanctuary. Now, in the Arabic language, there are a number of meanings to the word masaba. Two meanings. The first meaning of the word masaba would be a place that people keep returning to. All right? Something that you you would want to be attached to over and over again. The second meaning of masaba is a place of restoration. You go and you find some form of recovery. You go broken, you live fixed. We shall make sure that that house that you have built, O Ibrahim, will be as such. That's the function of that particular house. Now, this is talking about again the merit of Makkah, particularly Masjid Al Haram and also Kaaba. Yesterday, I was teaching a particular class. I, I do some family classes, and there was a student, and actually a, a, a public figure as well, and they were in Makkah. So everybody was attending class. And he had his he had his uh, phone facing the Kaaba, and it was greatly affecting me. I'm teaching and I'm looking at the Kaaba. I'm like, no, I wish I'm there. And then we were asking this particular question. Somebody asked a question, Ustad, which is actually a better or more merited place, Makkah or Medina? Right? Which is an important question. And scholars differ over this particular issue. Generally. Our scholars say Makkah is merited a bit more than Medina, and there are many reasons for so because we have Kaaba there. One, number two would be prayer in Masjid Al Haram is much more than prayer in Medina, correct? So generally, you would say that Makkah is superior to Medina. But then some scholars they put forth some arguments to talk about the great merit of Medina that you should not forget. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Makkah to Medina. Was it an easy thing for the Prophet? Yeah. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam that the Prophet made a dua at the outskirts of Makkah. Allahumma habib ilayna al Madina ta kahubbi na li Makkah ta awashad. Ya Allah, I'm leaving Makkah, and if not for my own people chasing me out, I wouldn't be living. Ya Allah, make me love Madina, similar to the love that I have for Makkah, or more. Some scholars say that there is an attachment in the heart of the Prophet to Medina more than to Makkah because of that particular du'a. The second evidence that some scholars say is that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was conquered Makkah, which means what? Makkah is under his control, and he could have at any time returned to Makkah, correct? But did he? Where did he choose to live until the end of his life? In Medina. These are arguments. And then there's also something greatly important that we need to realize as well. That in Medina, there is a particular place in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that it is a place unlike none other. And this is found, and as scholars make the particular discussion, right, pertaining to heaven. In Surah Al-Kahfi, I don't remember which verse. I think it's the last, the fourth last verse. If you guys can correct me on this. إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كانت لهم جنات الفردوس نزلا خالدين فيها لا يبغون عنها حيولا. What does it mean? Allah says, and for those who have done good upon belief that Allah has granted them, Allah would give them the highest of heaven, Firdaus, as a place of dwelling. خالدين فيها they would enter it eternally لا يبغون عنها حيولا. They would not want a replacement for it. 
If you go on holiday, wherever that you go, right, it is rarely the case in which you go to a particular place and you say, you know what, I'm done, I'm not going to go anywhere. The next holiday, I'm still going to go here. You go to Bali or you go to Ubud, eh, tiba-tiba Ubud. Eh. You know what, all of my holidays are going to be to, to Ubud. Or you go to UK or London or whatever it is, you know, all my holidays are going to be London. You don't say that. There's a replacement for all of these places. But pertaining to heaven, Allah says, when people enter heaven, they will reach to a sense of contentment if they will tell themselves, this is, this is it. There is no, nothing comparable to this, there is no replacement to this. Now we know already that we've talked about this particular issue before. Heaven is something that you cannot perceive. Although you have many descriptions of heaven, right? The Prophet tells us pertaining to the food of heaven, the dwelling of heaven, what you wear, what your age, the, the human condition and so on and so forth. But still the Prophet said, ما لا عين رأت ولا أذن سمعت ولا خطر على قلبي بشر It is that which the eyes has never seen before. What the ears has never heard before. And what the mind and the heart can never perceive. However, what if I tell you that part of heaven is on earth? What did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam say? Ma min baiti wa min bari rawdatun min riyadil jannah. Whatever that is between my house and my pulpit is a garden from the gardens of heaven. And what did our scholars say pertaining to what does it even mean that it is a garden from the many gardens of heaven? Scholars say that one of the opinions, right, would be that it is in fact the only land on earth when everything is destroyed at the end of time, it will not be destroyed, but rather be put back to heaven. So, rawdah of the Prophet wasallam, according to the opinions of our scholars, is in fact literally a part of heaven. So that is why, ladies and gentlemen, when you enter Medina, when you enter into the rawdah of the Prophet wasallam, you hear a lot of people saying this, right? When they come back home, they said, I need to go back. Immediately when you reach Singapore, you tell yourself, Sad, that feeling that I had in Makkah, that feeling that I had in Medina, is not there anymore, Sad. I need to go back soon. A lot of people like post-Umrah punya withdrawal, it's a real thing. You find yourself looking at flights malam-malam. <laughs> when is the next flight up? Because why? It is a place of return. Allah made Medina that way. And pertaining to Kaabah, what does Allah subhanahu say? Wa is ja'annal bayta mathabatan linnas. To the extent that some scholars say, an indication of Umrah that is mabrur, is that when a person goes to Makkah, and a person goes to Medina, they would dream of returning quickly. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah allows us to return to Makkah and Medina. And for those who have not yet been there, may Allah allow for you that particular journey, inshaAllah. Right? So here, Allah then tells Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam, we have not made it a reality that everybody amongst your lineage is going to be a good person, but we will allow for you this. And this is great enough. That Makkah shall be Mathabatan Linnas, a place that good people will oft return. Now, and then he moves on to say, Allah moves on to say, Wa amna, and it is safety. Now, that's not how you, you would usually describe something, right? Whenever that you would want to describe a person, you would use an adjective. But one of the ways in linguistics, that you would praise something greatly is to avoid using the adjective but use the noun. Instead of a person who is quick, you say that this guy, this guy is actually speedy. What are other adjectives to, to mention a person who is quick? The person is fast. Instead of saying that, you, you say, this guy is speed. To as if say that he is a definition of speed. When Allah talks about Makkah, when Allah talks about Kaaba, Allah does not say that it is Amina, a place of safety, or you will find safety in it. Allah says that Makkah will be safety and security itself. And our scholars say that it could mean many things. One of the things would be at the level of your heart. When a person reaches Makkah, every form of danger, every form of worry, every form of anxiety leaves you magically. It's a place of safety. Some scholars say that it also concerns to the ends of time. 
we were discussing Dajjal in one of our lessons pertaining to Al-Kahfi, I remember right? Dajjal at the end of time would enter every village and every city except for two. Makkah and Medina. So it is the most safe place on earth. So Allah says, it is not just a safe place, it is the definition of safety. Right? So these are not descriptions of other places on earth. Allah allows for such descriptions to only be attributed to Makkah and, and Medina. And he says, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى وَأَحِذْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَن تَهِرَ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُكَّعِ السُّجُودِ And we enjoin Ibrahim and Ismail saying, Purify my house for those who visit it and those who abide in it for devotion and those who bow down and those who prostrate themselves. Number one, some scholars say, in what situation did Ibrahim make this dua? Were there anybody around him? Did he already have a huge following? Our scholars say, no, no, and no. Ibrahim alayhi salam, however great he was, there was not a real following during the time of Nabiullah Ibrahim. We know some men who stayed in Makkah, who stayed with Hajar, but pertaining to Ibrahim himself, there is no mention of a true following during the time of Ibrahim. Maybe some. So he made this dua in loneliness. When he made this particular dua, was Makkah already a thriving city? No, it was barren and empty. Did he ever put perceive or foresee that in the future it would be like what it is today? No. So ladies and gentlemen, the dua of a sincere person and a person of taqwa, it goes far, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever that you make dua and that which you seem to be impossible to be achieved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, surely it can be attained. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we bear witness to the dua of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam coming to fruition in the very front of our eyes. How prosperous Makkah is, how Makkah has changed the lives of people and so on and, and so forth. Now, at the end of it, it's still interesting in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives another command to Ibrahim and Ismail. Now, at the beginning of this one, Wa izi batala Ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimatin fa'atammahun And we've instructed Ibrahim with many matters and he has already completed them all. Now, if you look at this particular verse, it is as if tutup kedai. Then, Ibrahim can now retire. I mean, do CPF ke, do bencin. But at the end of it, suddenly Allah says, but you know what, we command of you one more thing. <laughs> right? And Ibrahim was totally fine with it. Now what's the final commandment of Ibrahim? Of Allah to Ibrahim? It's none other than to make sure the purity and the sanctity of, of Makkah. Because in the beginning, Ibrahim was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some of your family members will be do good. Some of your family members are not going to do good. Now, in order to ensure purity of the people, you know what? You need to be custodians and protectors of this particular land. And hopefully, when people come to this particular land and you have gained control of it and purified it, they will also reach to a sense of purity. Ibrahim alayhi salam continued until the end of his life to purify this place. Now, when you also look pertaining to this particular instruction, Allah says, and purify this particular house, لِلْطَائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُكَّعْ وَالْسُّجُودِ Now, the word ta'ifin refers to what? People doing tawaf. The word aqifin refers to what? People doing itikaf. And then people who do ruku and people who do sujud. Now, think about it again. Were there people who did tawaf at that point of time? Were there people who did itikaf in Masjid al-Haram? Is prayer already done in a complete way like we do it today? No. And this is why we say, Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam laid down the foundations. He started it all. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam came to none other than complete or elaborate or crystallize the mission of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're talking about determination, you're talking about will, you're talking about committing to a particular task until the end of your life, there is no better example than truly than Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now we conclude with some practical stuff. There's already certain things uh, online here. There are still people asking about my cap. 
What is the headgear you're wearing called? From Ustaz just now say Oman Not available locally And there's commentary pertaining to my cap online Alright Now principles of sacrifice Now we learn that Nabi Allah Ibrahim alaihi salam sacrificed Well the entirety of his life was a sacrifice So now we need to apply this particular thing to our lives now Now what's the word for sacrifice in Arabic? Right? And the word that we usually refer to is the word Qurban Now, the word Qurban actually does not mean sacrifice per se Sacrificing an animal in which it happened during the time of Nabi Ibrahim to replace Nabi Ismail is actually called Nahar Nahar Fasalli li rabbika wan Nahar, that's the word And that is why Eid al-Adha is also called Yawmun Nahar but somehow, because of the greatness of that particular act of Ibrahim, sacrifice predominantly is represented through slaughter. But the word kurban in the Arabic language comes from the word karib, which means meal. Kurban literally means any act that you perform that brings you closer to God. And it requires some form of sacrifice. Now, certain principles of sacrifice first and foremost. Now, firstly, giving up something deserves to be called a sacrifice only when we love and value it. It is only considered to be a form of sacrifice when what you sacrifice would be things which you are attached to, things that you find value, and things that you love. If you don't love anything, a particular thing, and then you give it away, that is not sacrifice. For example, Allah says in the Quran, right? Lantanalul birra hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. Allah will not consider your charity part of real sacrifice until you forego whatever that you love. My common example would be nearing Ramadan later. A lot of people will be doing some form of a spring cleaning. And then you would somehow be shocked to realize that you have a particular dress or shirt or baju that you don't know where you bought it. Bila aku beli baju ni ya? And since it has not, it's still not anymore in style, gone out of fashion, or maybe you have shrunk or expanded, you tell yourself, oh, I can't use this anymore. And you say, you know what, I'm going to give it away. Thinking that it is a noble act. According to the standards of the Quran, it is not yet a sacrifice because you're not giving away something that you love. You have no value for it anymore. You're giving it away. Maybe there is some form of reward in it, inshallah, hoping to put some joy in the hearts of people. But is that considered to be a sacrifice? No. Right? So this is a type of ibadah that Ibrahim alayhi salam was consistent upon. Number two, it is more difficult and more necessary to sacrifice abstract things rather than the concrete or physical matters. Later on we're going to go. There are tangible forms of sacrifice and intangible sources of sacrifice. Thirdly, we can give up something we love and to which we attach value only for something we love more and to which we attach greater value. Now why would you give? Right? You give because you believe that the reward of Allah is greater than the item that you possess. You give because the comfort of people is something that you prefer over your own self. So number one, it is the value of the item that you're sacrificing. Number two would be where it is heading towards. You know that this is great. Right? And that is why I always say that when a person gives, giving is not a physical act. Giving is an act of emotion and spirituality. When you can be generous towards people, it comes with an idea. You give to a person, you help a person out because you have empathy. I, alhamdulillah, have enjoyed this particular thing for a long period of time. But there are people around me who have not had food for years, for days, for months. I give simply because, you know what, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than anything else. What Allah has in store for me is greater than whatever that I have. If Allah subhanahu has given me this, I would want to circulate it and help other people as well. When you give, it is not a physical act. It is a sign of empathy and a sign of your understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in order for a person to sacrifice, it is only possible when you know that whatever that you are contributing to is greater than whatever that you have. With that said, why should a person worry so much giving? 
when Allah talks about giving in the Quran مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَمْبَتَتْ سَبَعَ سَنَابِلَ فِي كُلِّ سُمْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ وَاللَّهُ يُضَعِفُ لِمَنْ شَاءٍ The analogy of a person who gives Allah says in the Quran is like a person planting a seedling From one seed, there are multiple saplings and from multiple saplings, multiple branches, a hundred branches and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies to whomever that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes so if you would want to stagnate your money, don't give if you would want to stay the way that you are, don't give from a spiritual perspective, the only way that you grow exponentially spiritually is when you give to the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now moving on quickly, there are two types of sacrifice, tangible and intangible now as for the tangible forms of sacrifice, there are a number of things energy, time, worldly possessions firstly, number one understand that nothing belongs to you everything belongs to Allah and when you sacrifice something in the way of Allah you're only returning it to the rightful owner to God belongs everything in the heavens and in the earth you don't own anything, anything it is all something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for you to hold for a bit and that's it Remember the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that when a young child dies, Allah asked the angels, Allah asked the angels, did you really take the joy of the parents away by taking the soul of that child? And the angels replied by saying, yes, Ya Allah. Allah asked again, did you really take away the source of joy from those parents? And the angels replied in the affirmative, Yes, Ya Allah. And then Allah asked the angels, When you took the life of that particular child away, that source of happiness from the parents, what did the parents see? The angels replied by saying, Hamidaka was tarja. He praised you, Ya Allah. And he also said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And this is a great sign of strength. When something is taken away from you, you still have the grace and the knowledge and the taqwa to say, Alhamdulillah. Allah takes away something from me, but Allah has given so many other things. Allah takes away from me now, but Allah will give me so much more. So in any case, Alhamdulillah. And then that person also says, the parent also says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. The affirmation and acknowledgement that everything comes from Allah. And if Allah would want to take it away, it is also the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah then tells the angels at that point, because they have said, Alhamdulillah, and inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, Allah says, Ubnu lahu baitan aw qasran fil jannati wa sammuhu bait al hamdi. Build for those parents now a house or a palace in heaven and call it the house of praise. And it's based on what? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. A person understands that this is all from Allah. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. So this is number one. Number two, whatever great value you may attach to worldly possessions, these will become not with your last breath. Nothing follows you. And maybe things don't even disappear the moment that you die even during our life if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for that things are taken away from us they will be taken away from us as well so what arrogance is that for a person to assume that he eternally has his possessions number three only by giving it away that Allah can receive that you can receive it back increase in manifold as we have mentioned earlier on so from a perspective of tangible matters you know what these are the things Sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Now we also said earlier on That there are also intangible forms of sacrifice And according to our scholars The intangible forms of sacrifice Are so much more difficult Now and they include Relationships Views and feelings Taste and temperament Our scholars say The sacrifice of love and attachment to people May take various shapes Depending on how it stands in the way of obeying Allah And striving to seek his pleasure Meaning, in certain situations, you have to forego or pull yourself away from people Willingly or unwillingly It may be a situation of fighting or a situation of conflict and so on and so forth And you have to pull yourself away from that particular person That's a sacrifice that you have to make 
a difficult situation might be and this is what Allah subhanahu wa talks about in the Quran in which if a person has parents who call you to disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that particular situation one needs to excommunicate himself from that particular parent if they force you to not worship Allah if you force you to do maksiat in that particular situation you know what pull yourself away so is it an easy thing? No. But this is also what you mean by sacrifice. Right? In other situations concerning death. You love a person so much and the departure of that particular person will not allow for you to let go. Allah says you have to sacrifice that particular feeling. Right? To be in a state of rida. Ya Allah, I'm in rida of this particular matter. That's also a form of sacrifice. Now other things also include feelings and emotions. At times, you must give up doing things you find you are not doing for the sake of Allah even if you like them and find them attractive and useful at other times you must involve yourself in things you do not like doing which are against your temperament you don't like certain people don't like certain activities certain things they need to do and we've had this particular discussion before certain people in regards to prayer they still drag themselves to prayer and this is me being real in certain ibadah are still difficult for people you might find solat apa sangat sejak dapat tahun solat you might find it easy but for certain people praying fulfilling that particular obligation is going against their temperament but they need to put that particular thing aside they need to embrace the discomfort for the sake of Allah is that not sacrifice? that is also sacrifice you have a liking for a particular thing by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with certain people have certain bad habits and they are comfortable with those bad habits and bad things that they do they need to sacrifice it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and lastly, even in very mundane affairs, you'll be required to sacrifice your taste and temperament you'll have to live, eat, sleep and dress in ways which may not be to your liking, to your taste or in harmony with your lifestyle and preferences you must accept them and accept them without grumbling willingly, without hurting others causing inconvenience or disruption so that's the reality and there are a number of issues also or, or viewpoints pertaining to sacrifices as well some sacrifices you need to make once in your life and that's it you need to master as much strength as possible to sacrifice and you're done but there are certain sacrifices in it you need to in the end overcome or go through each and every day there are certain sacrifices that people notice and know and there are many other sacrifices that people do not notice and know and there are sacrifices that are long term and there are sacrifices that are short term but again, going back to the story of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam kazalika najizil muhsinin and do not ever think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not notice your sacrifices for surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward everything now lastly ladies and gentlemen to end the entire thing our scholars ask the question like what might help you to strengthen yourself going through sacrifices what might be a motivation to help you go through sacrifices it is when as we have said before what you are sacrificing for you understand to have so much value than whatever that you're letting go and our scholars say loving Allah and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for you is a very strong motivation to help you go through sacrifices if I lose this I have greater things in store if I put aside a bit of this right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it with something greater than that so loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to our scholars is a strong motivating factor now this is a dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama in which we can ask Allah to allow for love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other things as well now here Abu Darda narrated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying one of Prophet Dawood's supplication was so this is part of a set of interesting hadith in which the Prophet talks about the dua of Prophets and we've talked about the dua of other Prophets in the Quran and also hadith of the Prophet so this is one of the dua of Nabiullah Dawood that the Prophet take it to be so important that he chose to teach it to the companions and to us and it is the dua Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbak wa hubba may yuhibbuk so sorry tak ada tanda you can write the diacritics uh, on your part Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbak wa hubba may yuhibbuk wal amal alladhi yuballighuni hubbak 
Allahumma j'al hubbaka ahabba ilayya min nafsi wa ahli wa min al ma'il baridi Ya Allah, I ask you for your love the love of those who love you and this which will cause me to attain your love Ya Allah, make your love dearer to me than my own self my family and cold water So Allah Ta'ala A'la wa ala ladies and gentlemen This I think, this entire story pertaining to Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam is the true definition of sacrifice And sacrifice again comes from a real understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And knowing that whatever that you go through in regards to pain and struggles and sacrifices Allah subhanahu wa notices and will replace it with something better So this is something that you need to hold on to Whenever they go into certain struggles and sacrifices in your life May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for us strength externally and also internally And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us with whatever that we are struggling with and sacrificing Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen And with that ladies and gentlemen Walhamdulillah We end And I open to questions if there's any I'm seeing a lot of questions online And I hope that it's not pertaining to my cap Now, there is a question Why must we mention Nabi Ibrahim every time we perform salah? For the very reasons that we have been discussing thus far right? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad Kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim Wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad Kama barak ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim Innaka hamidun majid If not read that in your prayer, salat asa, correct? To that degree It is also telling of the importance of Ibrahim Because whatever the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa taught us right, It's an extension of the ways of Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam So that's, that's the importance I also remember because I'm not sure whether you noticed what I said earlier on For some of you it might be a bit odd because I left out something from that particular salawat Which is what? Sayyidina And I remember there was a question who asked me that particular question said, do you say Sayyidina or without the Sayyidina? And this is a particular issue that has an academic debate to it And there are two opinions to this particular matter And I remember asking this particular question to a teacher of mine And then I meninggal dulu kat Marasat Junid Almarhum says uh, Sheikh Abdul Maqsud Al Farisi. So we were learning about not selawat per se but rather doa after prayer. Eh so doa after azan. Allahumma rabb hadhihi da'wati at-tamah was salati al-qa'imah. Ati kalau kalau versi radio. Ati Sayyidina Muhammad al So we ask our teacher in class in Madrasah Junid. Sheikh, the hadith that we are learning, we were learning hadith does not mention Sayyidina. But it's commonly practiced, and we hear this on the radios as well, that you will recite the Sayyidina. So what is your take on this particular issue? So my teacher replied by saying, our scholars debated this particular issue, but my view, he said, was, so he's an Egyptian sheikh, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor his own. He said, my perspective is this, if it pertains to matters of worship, meaning you're doing it in salat, or you're doing it as a particular worship that the Prophet taught this is a dua for azan this is a, this is salawat inside, right? and the Prophet taught you a particular structure stick to that particular structure but if you are talking about the Prophet and doing salawat outside of worship if you would want to add Sayyidina, can you? please do so for me, that is a very safe position However, there are scholars who still say that it is permitted to even mention Sayyidina in prayer or for the dua azan. And the argument is this. In Islam, there are two things pertaining to the issue of, of salawat. One is called imtithal. Imtithal simply means following exactly what the Prophet Wasallam did and there is great merit in that. The other one is the perspective of adab. You are mentioning Sayyidina as a matter of respecting the Prophet Sallallahu So they say that you can follow the route of imtithal Following exactly what the Prophet taught Or you could also follow the route of adab Being respectful towards the Prophet by adding Sayyidina These are the two opinions But if you ask me, based on what I've been taught I follow the first route In Salat, I leave out the Sayyidina Dua of Azan, because the Hadith does not mention Sayyidina, I also do not mention the Sayyidina But outside of it, if you would want to add it, fine Right? So that you know Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'la Can women go Umrah without mahram? Because the newly updated law 
Does it go against what is taught to us in religion? What are your thoughts on it? Oh, masih masih perbincangan umrah lagi ya. Somebody noticed that these are the weird things that you guys uh, noticed. Ani kira marah bukan marah. That you said you've been dressing differently these days. If you remember me years ago, anybody who has been here since like six or seven years ago, I used to always teach in a suit and tie. Anybody remember that? Ada orang anggup lah. I've not worn a suit and tie long time. Recently, I've been wearing a lot of songkok tinggi and teluk belanga and baju kurung. I have a personal uh, the, uh, fashion fashion advisor. You know, I'm, I'm not joking. A lot of what I wear is actually gifts. And the person is here even. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Now, you see me with my funny hat and juba always. It's just me clinging on to the memory of Makkah and Medina. Right? When I wear these things, it reminds me of Makkah and Medina. So that's why. And it's also comfortable. It's also convenient because tak payah gosok seluar. Too much information? <laughs> Now, going to the issue of Umrah, what's the ruling of females traveling without mahram? Now, let's begin. So, this is how you methodologically address the issue. Eh? Look at the hadith first, find the default ruling, and then build your way up. Now, what's the hadith of the Prophet? The Prophet says that it's not halal for a woman to travel, right, except for with her zu mahram, except for that she travels with a mahram. It's in the hadith. In some narration, it mentions travel three days without a mahram. Not permitted. Now, when you study hadith, right, and this is something that everybody knows too, there are always two prongs to studying hadith. The first perspective, the first prong of studying hadith is what you will refer to as the riwaya, the authentication. Is it sahih or not sahih? Is it hasan? Is it da'if? Many different narrations and so on and so on. This is one. The second prong of learning hadith is understanding what it means and how to apply it. Just because a hadith is sahih does not mean that you should jump on it quickly. Our scholars say, Sihatu sanadi la yastalzimu sihatul amali bihi. Just because a hadith is sahih does not mean that you can jump on it quickly. There are many considerations on top of that. Remember once we discussed a hadith that is very controversial, but the hadith is sahih, in narration of Imam al-Bukhari, that a group of people reached Medina and they were unable to acclimatize to Medina and they fell ill. They went to doctors here and there to no avail. The Prophet suggested to them to drink from the milk and urine of camel. Remember the hadith? So it's in the hadith. It's sahih. Does it mean that you need to apply it? Hmm. In all honesty, there were people doing it in Medina and Mecca. Among Singaporeans, by the way. When you study the Sharah, long discussion, our scholars say, nope, this is a khususi of the Prophet. It's a one-off thing that happened during the time of the Prophet, specifically to those people. And when you study the history, they were bad people after all. And if it was a sunnah of the Prophet, the companions would be the first people to do it. But do you hear Abu Bakr doing it? Umar, Uthman, Ali, none. So just because the hadith is sahih does not mean that you can jump on it quickly. No, there are considerations. Right? I know that it's very easily accessible to the hadith. So I know of this hadith. So I go on sunnah.com. Say kencang say sunnah.com. And he says at the footnote, so Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Confirm Sahih. So said, yes, yes. But there are other considerations as well. Now the hadith says, it's not halal for a woman to travel in a narration more than three days. Now one of the considerations in fit and in the study of hadith is to determine whether the hadith is supposed to be, supposed to be taken literally or supposed to be considered its spirit. Back then we used to discuss this particular issue pertaining to siwak. Kenapa siwak gini ya? Tolong takkan kunci ya. Now what's the ruling of, of siwak? Sunnah. Law la ana syuqa ala ummati la amartum bi siwaki anni kulli salah. Siwaku matharatun lil fami wa mardatun lil Many hadith of the Prophet to the matter of siwak. Now but can a person instead of using siwak use oral B toothbrush? Will you get the rewards or not? So is the prophet pointing to the item or is the prophet encouraging oral hygiene? Item or intent? So the hadith of three days, traveling without a mahram, is it a literal hadith to be taken as it is or is it something beyond that? Now some scholars take the first position. Tak boleh. And that is why, because the, the questioner mentioned about the law, because for a long period of time, that was a law. 
If you apply for Hajj or Umrah and you do not include a mahram, you cannot. And then there was a loosening of that particular law, but if you go with a group of people in which there is some form of a protection that the group provides, then boleh. But now it seems to be much more looser. Because there is a discussion behind it. Now, why did the Prophet ﷺ prohibit women from traveling? What is the core issue there? The core issue is safety. The core issue is safety. Especially during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly in the southern part of Arabia, Yemen and so on and so on. Right? Many times the Prophet talks about Sana'a and Hadramat and how dangerous it was at that point of time. That particular law to prohibit was not to limit women in regards to their movement, but rather to care for in regards to their safety and security. That's it. A lesser example, for example, for instance, back then, Saudi Arabia did not allow for women to even drive. And it enraged a lot of people. Such a backwards country, right? It's not progressive at all. If you have ever driven in Saudi Arabia or in any Arab country, you will know how difficult it is. If you go on a highway from one exit to the other exit, it might be a possibility 45 minutes, one exit to another exit. In the middle of it, you don't find beautiful structures, no, the desert. If a lady drives, for example, and something happens to the car in the middle of the desert, what is she going to do? So their context is specific. This law is to protect women. That's it. But now they realize that the situation has changed. In between exits, you have structures, right? Enforcement, security, their assistance on the roads is much easier. And for that, they change that particular law. Because why? They are considering the context. They're reading the terrain. Now, today, there is a shift of that particular fatwa because why? Because it seems to be based on the assessment that they can now assure a bit more security. Hence, the removal for the requirement for mahram. Now, is this something that all of the scholars agree to? No. But again, this is where we have the blessing of multiple opinions. So again, when you ever hear of this issue of multiple opinions, changing of fatwa here and there, there are many dynamics and things at play. Understand them first and then figure out why things are the way that they are. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'ala. Before I continue, because uh, people are quite lively on the chat box, and then, yes? It is Saudi law. But again, Saudi claims itself to be a Muslim state constitutionally. They derive a lot of their laws, if not directly, indirectly from the Quran and the Sunnah as well. So they're looking at all of these hadiths of the Prophet, and it seems to be the case that a, a dominant value that we need to apply onto the society would be none other than security for women, the well-being of women. So they apply that particular law accordingly. Because uh, I, I'm sure that in the hadith of the Prophet, the Prophet has never mentioned Toyota or uh, but the issue of security is, is somewhat uh, apparent, so they needed to have that particular law. Yep. Yes? I just want to understand about the demarcation of Tanah Haram. Alamak, kenapa lah? I actually saw that coming a mile away. <laughs> So I came back from Umrah and my father went to Umrah with a mission. One of the mission of my father was trying to figure out this. Right? Now you see vloggers at the gate of Masjid Nabawi. Recently, uh, the government of India, one of the ministers, was around that particular area. So what's the thing there? I'm not saying that I'm agreeing with this. I disagree with this. And, and, and the disagreement comes from the lack of clarification provided. Currently, the official statement is that there is a difference between the connotation and the legal bearing of what Tanah Haram means. Now, currently, the explanation is that there is a differentiation between the Tanah Haram of Makkah and Tanah Haram of Medina. So that's the explanation. So for Makkah, clearly, there is not a possibility at all for non-Muslims to enter. But for Medina, there is a possibility to a degree. Now, what the justifications are, Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'alam, I don't know. It has never been the case for years 
For 1,400 years, we have never compromised on this particular issue. Suddenly, there was such a dramatic shift, and the worst part would be no real explanation was given. So in all honesty, I don't know. And I'm actually quite frustrated with this particular issue as well. We are still waiting for an explanation. We are explaining. Well, give me an explanation. But no, the entirety of the world. Because even when my father, he would meet like a Saudi person, this person, he would ask everybody, like, do you know or not why? Do you have an explanation to this? And they would say, we don't know. And they would always point to, they would say a particular word. Will I get cancelled for this? Dulu, bila orang kritik Saudi Arabia, kena cancel lah. They would always say, the young leadership. That's the term that they would use. They would say, hukum masyabab. They say, this is a young leadership, very different. We also don't know. That's the answer. So I really don't know. Wallahu a'ala. Yes? I'm going to write on to this question. Okay. When Hajj or Umrah? Hajj. Mm, I, I think that an obligation is not suspended or an obligation cannot be taken away without legitimate causes. Right? There are many things at play and things can get complicated from a political perspective, from a humanitarian perspective and so on and so forth. But, but the issue would be that you're angry at somebody, you're dissatisfied with somebody, but you are now doing something that would anger Allah. We understand the fact that Tanah Haram is within the custody and care of the Saudi government. It's a government issue, yes. But that does not necessarily mean that everything is tied to the government. Because Tanah Haram is Tanah Haram. Masjid Al-Haram is owned by Allah. Masjid Nabawi is owned by Allah. Our obligation and loyalty is to Allah and not to any state or entity. Right? I do understand the frustration of people on the ground. But in the end, whatever that you are doing in trying to deny that particular matter, there is no proof of concept that it brings about to any form of betterment. I think that if the intention is to help people out, if to help people who are oppressed, I think that there are other much more proven ways to do so, as opposed to denying yourself of an obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated upon you. It's a complicated matter, I do understand, but I don't find enough justification for a person to remove an obligation of Allah upon him just because he's dissatisfied with a particular government. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa ala. The, the soalan ni macam makin panjang, makin panjang tau kat sini. Anybody here? Uh, let's look at one, two cases and then we're done. Oh, somebody actually asked the exact same question. Oh, that was you. Oh. <laughs> Wah, the dual realities, an offline and an online reality. MashaAllah. When is Al Qudwa Academy moving to Arab Street? Don't. <laughs> Is there by any chance Al Qudu Academy uh, to conduct Umrah course anytime soon? Hmm. We'll update soon. <laughs> Would zakat be considered as a sacrifice of wealth? Uh, uh, somehow we may be attached to wealth we have. Yes, I would say yes. Right. Although it is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the experience of performing an obligation could still be somewhat discomforting for certain people. So Allah is obligated upon you, but who, whoever says, I'm, sorry, I'm willingly praying, I don't have an issue at all. Pertaining to prayer, everything is fine, sir. right? What? Uh, hashtag geng solat subuh macam Jumat. No, geng solat subuh hari-hari, sir. I don't have an issue at all. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm pro that particular movement, if anybody would like to ask my position, right? No, no, I think that there is a bit of a, a sacrifice that you do feel, a bit of a pinch that you feel, even if it is part of an obligation, right? I, th I think it is. And Hajj is an important, it's an interesting example in which when Allah obligates Hajj, Allah says, Man ilayhi sabila, when a person is able. It is part of fard when a person is able. Allah tied the obligation of Hajj to the notion of ability. To mean what? It's difficult. Ask anybody who goes to Hajj or even Umrah. 
it is a difficult thing and to a degree and Imam Syatibi rahmatullah alaihi addresses this particular issue the greater the amount of difficulty that you face in performing a particular obligation of worship the greater the reward and this is truly a personal issue and that is why I've been repeating this particular issue before in Islam a lot of things are apparent but so much more things are personal and intimate to you and to you only and your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exclusively your relationship with Allah you might feel difficult Allah knows nobody might know right so even in zakat kena keluar duit right right is it considered to be a sacrifice yep. last Assalamualaikum Ustaz hope you are well Alhamdulillah uh, what are this um, uh, the person is writing an Arabic word in English and I'm trying to figure out what the word is what's the difference between sabat and su okay uh, uh, sab, sab, sabat and sumud uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the question so I, I will not attempt to answer nanti kalau if you are the person asking Madam Azlina if you are a bit more clear of this particular issue please uh, message me I think we're good dah telajak ni chop 20 we'll end inshallah ladies and gentlemen thank you so so much uh, first and foremost, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our presence here. This form of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward us with, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah instills in our hearts a sense of joy and happiness always. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every pain, every struggle, every sacrifice that we put forth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards in this world and in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our sacrifices go unnoticed. Goes notice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces every form of pain with pleasure every form of difficulty with ease and every form of worry with happiness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunana minal khasirin Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata'in wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan marzuqna attiba'ah wa arina al-baqila baqila marzuqna ishtinaba Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana tawakina azab al-nar wa sallallahu ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa barak wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen thank you so so much everybody have a good day ahead assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Oh,